Somewhere I have never travelled, gladly beyond any experience, your eyes have their silence. In your most frail gesture are things which enclose me, or which I cannot touch, because they are too near. Your slightest look easily will unclose me. Though I have closed myself as fingers, you open always petal by petal myself, as spring opens, touching skillfully, mysteriously, her first rose. Or if your wish be to close me, I and my life will shut very beautifully, suddenly, as when the heart of this flower imagines the snow carefully everywhere descending. Nothing which we are to perceive in this world equals the power of your intense fragility, whose texture compels me with the colour of its countries, rendering death and forever with each breathing. I do not know what it is about you that closes and opens. Only something in me understands the voice of your eyes is deeper than all roses. Nobody, not even the rain, has such small hands. Hello and welcome to Words That Burn, a podcast about poetry. My hope for this podcast is that when you listen, you leave with a better understanding of a certain poem than when you came in. This week, we'll be looking at Somewhere I Have Never Travelled Gladly Before by E.E. Cummings. I have a quick suggestion before we start this podcast. If you can, grab a copy of the poem in some kind of form so that you can read along with us. It's a little bit easier to understand in that regard. The reason I chose E.E. Cummings is pretty simple, and I think this quote sums it up fairly well. No one else has ever made avant-garde experimental poems so attractive to the general and the special reader. Randall Jarrell. This was in an introduction to a hundred essential E.E. E. Cummings poems, and it's a pretty good summation of why E.E. E. Cummings has stood the test of time. The reason that this poem was chosen is that a lot of E.E. E. Cummings' work is open to interpretation, and I feel like this is one of the most accessible to begin with. The poem, Somewhere I Have Never Travelled Gladly Before, was published in 1931 and holds all the seeds of the kind of poet Cummings would become. A poet who didn't care for, or didn't need, the rules of grammar. A poet for whom syntax and word order were more like guidelines. A poet who would make sure that his work plumbed the depths of the mixed up and muddled emotions that were found in most people's hearts, and he'd find a way to resonate with each and every one. A poet who would, surprisingly, go on to become one of the most beloved in the American canon. Within Somewhere I Have Never Travelled Gladly Before, we can see all of this from the very first verse. Somewhere I have never travelled, gladly beyond any experience, your eyes have their silence. In your most frail gesture are things which enclose me, or which I cannot touch because they are too near. In this first stanza, Cummings is talking to someone, I've always assumed a lover. We become aware that the somewhere of the opening line is nowhere physical, confirmed by the following statement beyond any experience. I don't think Cummings just means his own experience here, I think he means beyond any human experience. He speaks of how unreadable this person is. Your eyes have their silence. They give him nothing to reassure him when they interact. From this point, Cummings goes about establishing the power dynamic between these two, and the imagery of delicacy and fragility begins to flood the poem. In your most frail gesture, things which I cannot touch. This person holds power over him beyond the physical. I'm always left with the question, can he not touch her because he's afraid to hurt her, or because she simply can't be touched? Your slightest look easily will unclose me. Though I have closed myself as fingers, you open always petal by petal myself as spring opens, touching skillfully, mysteriously, her first rose. The imagery of subtlety and weakness is repeated here, with slightest look. His lover becomes the personification of spring, further elevating her status as something unique, ephemeral, simply beyond Cummings himself. It is also the first noting 
of resistance on Cummings' part. Though I have closed myself as fingers, it indicates to me that he does not find this infatuation easy. This outpouring is not so much willing as necessary. The transformative power of this lover's attention is hinted at in the following lines. You open always, petal by petal, myself as spring opens, touching skillfully, mysteriously, her first rose. He has been changed from something clenched and tight to an object of joy and rejuvenation. Or if your wish be to close me, I and my life will shut very beautifully, suddenly, as when the heart of this flower imagines the snow, carefully everywhere descending. This stanza serves to show just how much power she has over him. She need only wish joy or heartbreak on him, and he will comply. The idea of her as spring, and of he as a flower, further deepens the power dynamic of their relationship. She is in control of the bloom, and he is only one flower of many. In the line, or if your wish be to close me, or if your wish be to close me, to me, serves as a kind of rejection. Though Cummings himself seems to envision no pain in this rejection, stating he would shut very beautifully. This coupled with the final line, snow carefully descending everywhere, is oddly peaceful. There is an acceptance of the way things are, a natural balance that will be upheld. Her personification as spring here is very reminiscent of the pagan imagery Cummings used in his early days at Harvard. Rejuvenation and transformation are center stage. It showcases the juxtaposition of imagery between romanticism, a deep abiding love of all things related to nature and the mystic, and imagism, using language to perfectly describe an object in its simplest form. This hybrid form between romanticism and imagism would become the hallmark of Cummings' poetic voice. Nothing which we are to perceive in this world equals the power of your intense fragility whose texture compels me with the colour of its countries, rendering death and forever with each breathing. The fourth stanza becomes an unusual refrain. It is asymmetrical from the rest of the poem, yet it cements the notion of this lover as something other, not only for him, but for everyone. This is signified in the we that we find in this stanza. This incomprehensible otherworldly concept is driven home by the oxymoron intense fragility. The idea of somewhere I have never travelled from the first stanza is revisited with the line whose texture compels me with the colour of its countries. A possible comparison to old maps with their colour-coded countries in faded fabrics. These final lines of stanza four are among some of the most challenging of the whole poem. The introduction of the word textures hints at the facts that Cummings sees this woman as a person with more facets than most. She's layered, filled with sides that Cummings would explore, were she not so out of reach to him. The strong theme of rejuvenation returns in the line, rendering death and forever with each breathing. And once again, it's a phrase all at war with itself. How can something breathe and die endlessly? To me, it's a parallel to the joy and frustration that Cummings feels throughout this infatuation. I do not know what it is about you that closes and opens. Only something in me understands the voice of your eyes is deeper than all roses. Nobody, not even the rain, has such small hands. The verse here shifts significantly. It's less of a direct address and closer to a classic Shakespearean aside. The parentheses here act as a form of poetic experimentation. This is another element that aimed at encompassing modernity into all of Cummings' work something he picked up from his association with poets like Ezra Pound, and particularly Amy Lowell. To me, it indicates that Cummings fully intended for his spring to hear the first four stanzas, but that this stanza is a much quieter internal affair, a silent revelation on just what she is to him. This rings true in the line, only something in me understands, the voice of your eyes is deeper than all roses. It also seems as though she may have finally confided in him, which is why he hears, Only something in me understands, the voice of your eyes is deeper than all the roses. It seems here as though she may have finally confided in him. He may have finally had a chance to hear her voice. And this has given him some kind of divine blessing. Only something in me understands. Throughout much of the poem, Cummings has been debating as to whether or not the unclosing effect this woman has on him 
is a positive. This debate is laid to rest at the very end of the poem. The parentheses fade away. Cummings is addressing his love directly again, with a resounding statement meant to be heard not only by her, but by all. Nobody, not even the rain, has such small hands. It seems an oddly humble note to end on, the small hands of this woman, but he is once again referring to her delicacy, her finesse, and the effect that it has on him. So why did I choose this poem? E. Cummings for me represents an interesting bridge between the romantic age of poetry and the often vexing modernist movement that dominated much of his youth. He is all at once metaphysical, yet steeped in poetic tradition. It was once said of him, the traditional lyric situation, representing the lover speaking of love to his lady, has been given in our time a special flavour and emphasis by Cummings. Not only the lover and his lady, but love itself, its quality, its value, its feel, its meaning, is a subject of continuing concern to our speaker. In dealing with love, he carved out a niche for himself, and it could be argued that he never really changed. He found what worked for him, and he stuck with it. It seemed to work for him, however, as today he is widely recognised as one of the world's greatest love poets. Love, his obsessive theme, served him well. Most importantly in all this, I think somewhere I have never travelled gladly is the best example of how Cummings' understanding of love grew over time. In his early days at Harvard, he wrote of love in a scandalous way, hoping to titillate and shock his reader. This grew into something more lustful during and after the Great War. His poems at that time brimmed with nihilism and a loss of intimacy. Death and sex were never far from his stanzas. This poem, however, published in 1931, shows that E. e. Cummings found his way back to a more intimate form of love. It comes to symbolise the very kind of rejuvenation he so often wrote about. And for me, that makes it one of his best poems. So, how did I do? Did you enjoy this interpretation of the poem? Did I convert you into an E.E. E. Cummings fan? Or do you completely disagree with my reading of the poem? That's completely okay, because every reading that I give you is quite personal. There's a lot of research that goes into each script. If you'd like to see the show notes for this episode, you can find them at wordsthatburnpodcast.com. If you have a recording of a poem, or if you'd like to hear a certain poem discussed on this podcast, you can get in touch with me at wordsthatburnpodcast at gmail.com, or you can find me on Instagram at wordsthatburnpodcast. The music for this week's episode was provided by Scott Buckley. You can find all of his amazing sounds over at scottbuckley.com. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, it would be great if you could give me a review. Or if you know anybody and you're listening to me on Spotify who might enjoy this podcast, you can send it to them. Um, I would love your feedback in general. And I really appreciate you taking the time to spend with me today. And I hope to talk to you all again very soon.